from the ancient, slim, sleek war canoes of Egypt's earliest days, around 3100 BC, powered by teams of rowers and designed for ramming and sinking enemy ships, to today's colossal nuclear-powered behemoths, armed with cutting-edge naval warfare gizmos, capable of obliterating the most formidable of the enemies with just the push of a button. Naval warships have sailed through centuries of innovation to reach their current awe-inspiring form. And amidst the recent arms race dragging us into the ultimate tug of war, these machines continue to draw the world's supreme powers into an unwanted dance for dominance that's set to shape the tides of global power play for centuries to come. A warship or combatant ship is a vessel crafted and chiefly purposed for naval combat. Typically, they're part of a nation's military might. Beyond just being armed to the teeth, these vessels are engineered to take a hit and zip through the waves with more speed and agility than any other average seafaring craft. Across the ocean, naval warships come in a wild variety, from those colossal aircraft carriers to the nimble littoral combat ships. You've got your destroyers, amphibious assault ships, cruisers, frigates, corvettes, and submarines, each with its own unique flair and purpose. However, what's fascinating is how these roles and designs have evolved over time. Nowadays, they're all getting equipped with a mix of anti-surface, anti-submarine, and anti-aircraft capabilities, blurring the lines between their traditional categories. This shift has left some scratching their heads about how to classify them, but still it gives us a ton of insight into each type of warship. Among all the majestic vessels of war, none captured the imagination quite like the aircraft carrier. These floating fortresses, teeming with 5,000 to 6,000 souls far from home, yet close to the heart of naval operations, represent the pinnacle of maritime might. A single one of these supercarriers wields enough firepower to rival entire air forces of some nations, standing as a formidable symbol of a nation's strength and projection of power. But an aircraft carrier is more than just a platform for projecting force. It's a mobile airbase, a city at sea with a full-time flight deck and the capacity to carry, arm, deploy, and recover a multitude of aircraft. Its air wing is a force to be reckoned with, capable of executing over 150 strike missions simultaneously, hitting more than 700 targets in a day. Yet beyond its offensive capabilities, an aircraft carrier is a versatile asset, protecting friendly forces, engaging in electronic warfare, supporting special operations, and conducting search and rescue missions. However, despite being armed to the teeth, these giants of the sea seldom sail alone. They are the linchpin of a carrier strike group, which is a formidable assembly that includes not just the carrier itself, but also at least one cruiser, two destroyers or frigates, and a carrier air wing comprising 65 to 70 aircraft. This group might also include submarines, logistic ships, and supply vessels, forming a robust and flexible force capable of projecting power across vast distances and in diverse environments. Strategically, the aircraft carrier is the centerpiece of modern combat fleets, replacing the battleship as the flagship of a fleet. Its diplomatic and tactical significance cannot be overstated. As former United States Secretary of State Henry Kissinger once remarked, an aircraft carrier is 100,000 tons of diplomacy. Its presence in international waters allows it to project power without infringing on territorial sovereignty, enabling it to respond swiftly to global crises. The saga of aircraft carriers began in the early 1920s, when these seaborne platforms first took to the waves, revolutionizing the way aircraft were stored, launched, recovered, and serviced at sea. Since then, they've undergone a remarkable evolution, from humble wooden vessels used for deploying balloons to the colossal nuclear-powered behemoths of today, capable of tackling any challenge, any time, anywhere. One of the critical attributes that define an aircraft carrier is speed. Swift and agile, these giants of the sea must be able to deploy rapidly to any corner of the globe, evading detection and targeting by enemy forces. Their high speed also creates the crucial wind over the deck, enhancing the lift available for fixed-wing aircraft to carry fuel and ammunition. To stay ahead of the game, especially against a stealthy threat posed by nuclear submarines, 
aircraft carriers need to clock speeds of over 30 knots. Modern navies have created a variety of aircraft carrier variants, each tailored to specific operational needs. These variants are sometimes considered subtypes of aircraft carriers and sometimes distinct types of naval aviation capable ships. They can be classified based on the aircraft they carry and their operational roles. While traditional carriers relied on diesel fuel, newer American carriers are powered by nuclear reactors. As of January 2024, the world's seas are patrolled by 47 active aircraft carriers operated by 14 navies, with the United States Navy leading the pack with its 11 large nuclear-powered fleet carriers, each capable of carrying around 80 fighters, making them the largest carriers globally, with a combined deck space exceeding that of all other nations combined. Now, just like aircraft carriers, there's another class of warships that can carry vertical and short takeoff or landing aircraft while featuring a hangar-like well deck located at the waterline in the stern, enabling the launch and recovery of landing craft such as hovercraft without the need for a crane. But these warships are not aircraft carriers. In the vast expanse of the Pacific during World War II, the Imperial Japanese Army had its own array of unique vessels, akin to the renowned aircraft carriers of the Imperial Japanese Navy. These were the landing craft carriers, crafted to transport both landing craft and aircraft simultaneously. The ingenious plan was to launch these aircraft alongside the landing crafts, employing them for combat air patrol, aerial reconnaissance, and close air support. Among these pioneering vessels was the Shinsumaru, a trailblazer completed in 1934 that set the stage for the modern amphibious assault ships we know today. An amphibious assault ship stands as a vital component of amphibious warfare, serving to land and support ground forces during amphibious assaults. While its design might draw parallels to that of an aircraft carrier due to their shared heritage, the primary focus of an amphibious assault ship differs significantly. Rather than hosting strike aircraft, its aviation facilities are geared towards accommodating helicopters, essential for providing crucial support to ground forces. At the heart of an amphibious assault lies a complex military operation that involves a coordinated effort of naval and landing forces to mount an attack from the sea onto enemy territory. The ultimate goal is to establish a beachhead, a secure area on the enemy's coastline from which further operations can be conducted. Amphibious assault ships are meticulously designed to support these critical operations, delivering troops and equipment to the hostile shore for sustained ground operations. These ships are equipped with a well deck, a versatile area at the stern that can be flooded and opened to deploy landing craft, amphibious vehicles, and small boats. Additionally, they boast extensive facilities to accommodate troops, provide command and control capabilities, and offer medical support ensuring the seamless execution of operations on land. The Destroyers To grasp the significance of destroyers, let's journey back to the late 19th century, a pivotal era marked by a global naval landscape in flux. Nations worldwide were engaged in a fierce arms race and technological rivalry, vying for supremacy on the high seas. Amidst this backdrop, the year 1866 proved transformative for naval warfare. Prior to this period, naval combat primarily occurred on the water's surface, with battleships heavily armored to withstand gunfire. However, everything changed when English engineer Robert Whitehead introduced the world's first effective self-propelled underwater torpedo, aptly named the Whitehead Torpedo. This invention revolutionized naval warfare, offering a means to strike at large ships beneath their protective armor. These torpedoes could be deployed from a small, swift, and relatively affordable vessel called torpedo boats and possessed the capability to cripple or even sink a battleship with a single decisive strike. What's more, the turbine engines powering these torpedo-carrying vessels enabled them to achieve speeds that rivaled the lumbering, slow-firing guns of battleships and cruisers, posing a significant threat. So, in response to this, a new class of vessels, the catchers, emerged. 
These heavily armed picket boats were tasked with escorting the battle fleet, requiring exceptional seaworthiness and endurance. As these vessels grew in size to meet their operational demands, they earned the designation Torpedo Boat Destroyers. While larger than their torpedo boat counterparts, they remained significantly smaller than battleships and cruisers, endowing them with enhanced maneuverability and the ability to effectively counter torpedo attacks. As years of technological progress unfolded, destroyers evolved from mere guardians of anchorages to dynamic vessels capable of assuming offensive roles traditionally held by torpedo boats. So, in addition to their anti-torpedo boat armaments, destroyers were equipped with torpedo tubes, broadening their capabilities. During World War I and the preceding era, destroyers were primarily tasked with shielding their own battle fleets from enemy torpedo attacks and launching similar assaults on enemy battleships. However, in contemporary naval operations, destroyers have transcended their original roles to become one of the major surface combatants operated by most navies, often reaching sizes of up to 6,000 tons. Beyond their size and defensive capabilities, modern destroyers have evolved into remarkably versatile warships, capable of executing complex and diverse missions. Equipped with advanced technologies such as depth charges, sonar, guided missile systems, and a suite of anti-air and anti-submarine warfare weaponry, destroyers are now adept at a wide array of combat operations, effectively countering multifaceted threats. And as these vessels have grown in size and firepower, they have begun to blur the lines with another category of warships, the cruisers. While cruisers are nominally expected to be larger, this is not always the case. In the modern naval lineup, cruisers emerge as the heavyweights, often taking the second spot in size after aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships. These versatile giants can tackle a variety of tasks, from hunting down enemy threats to guarding convoys and controlling vital sea routes. Ranging from 7,000 to 10,000 tons, these multi-purpose vessels are not just defenders of their own fleets and shores, but also pose a formidable challenge to adversaries. But let's rewind a bit. The term cruiser has been around for ages, but it hasn't always meant the same thing. Initially used in the 17th century to describe any independent warship, it focused more on a ship's mission than its specific type. During the Age of Sail, cruising referred to specific roles like scouting, protecting trade routes, or carrying out raids, often performed by smaller, agile vessels acting as the fleet's eyes and ears. While the name cruiser has endured, today's cruisers are a far cry from their ancestors. Back in the day, the fleet saw cruisers of all shapes and sizes, ranging from the nimble, medium-sized protected cruisers to the hulking armored ones, which, while not as powerful or fortified as pre-dreadnought battleships, were still substantial in size. As the 20th century progressed, the cruiser took center stage in surface combat, with battleships fading into obscurity due to the rise of aircraft carriers, which were considered a different breed altogether due to their reliance on air wings for combat rather than onboard armaments. However, with the march of time, especially after World War II, heavy cruisers fell out of favor due to their significant economic burden. As the century drew to a close, most navies phased them out, decommissioning these once proud vessels. As of 2023, only three nations maintain active duty cruisers, the United States, Russia, and Greece. The Russian Navy boasts two Kirov-class and two Slava-class guided missile cruisers, while the United States Navy operates 15 Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruisers. Meanwhile, the Hellenic Navy of Greece proudly maintains the cruiser Georgios Averov, an Italian-built vessel kept in ceremonial commission as their flagship to this day. In a naval fleet, when you've got a mix of destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers, you're looking at a serious force. But with these big, bulky ships, the fleet's stealth and agility can take a hit. That's where the smaller guys, like the modern frigates, step up to the plate. Frigates are some of the smallest blue water combat ships you'll find in a navy. They're all about agility, 
swooping in to protect the rest of the fleet, merchant ships, and even amphibious forces from sea threats, especially those sneaky submarines. They're like the multitaskers of the Navy, kitted out with all sorts of sensors and weapons depending on what they're up against. Like cruisers, the term frigate has changed a lot over time in naval warfare. Back in the Seven Years' War from 1956 to 63, it used to mean something a bit different. Frigates were smaller than those huge three-decked ships, but still packed a punch. They were fast, with all their firepower concentrated on a single gun deck, plus some guns on the back and front. Later in the 19th century, armored frigates emerged as these super-tough ironclad warships, eventually rendering the original frigates obsolete and making the term kind of phased out. But then, during World War II, the name frigate made a comeback to describe these middle-of-the-road escort ships that were bigger than corvettes but not quite destroyers. After the war, frigate became a catch-all term for a whole range of ships. Some navies saw them as big anti-submarine warships for the open ocean, while others used the label for ships that were basically corvettes, destroyers, or even nuclear-powered guided missile cruisers. However, regardless of the fuss and its names and designations, typically today's frigates can weigh up to 3,000 tons and can zip through the water at speeds of 27 to 30 knots, all while accommodating a crew of around 200 people. They're often equipped with helicopters for anti-submarine warfare operations. Take the Chivalic class in the Indian Navy, for example. They can even reach speeds of up to 32 knots. However, the United States Navy said goodbye to its last Oliver Hazard Perry class frigate in 2015, replacing them with a new class of ships, which we'll talk about later in the video. But first, let's dive into the Corvettes. Ships smaller than frigates usually fall into the categories of corvettes or missile boats, which don't come with full air defense radar due to their size. Corvettes today take on various roles like coastal patrol craft, missile boat, and fast attack craft. These ships typically range from 500 to 2,000 tons, but some recent designs can reach up to 3,000 tons and even have a hangar for a helicopter, blurring the line with smaller frigates in terms of size and capabilities. However, unlike frigates, modern corvettes lack the endurance and seaworthiness for long voyages, so they tend to stick to coastal waters rather than venturing far into the open sea. Even back in the age of sail, corvettes were mainly used for coastal patrol, minor conflicts, supporting larger fleets, or making diplomatic appearances. The modern corvettes made their debut during World War II, designed to be quick and easy to build for patrolling and escorting convoys. The British naval designer, William Reed, came up with a small ship based on a single shaft design that was simple and could be built using merchant construction standards. This made it perfect for quick production in large numbers, especially in smaller shipyards that weren't used to making naval vessels. Nowadays, lots of countries around the world have their own Corvette warships. Russia has the biggest fleet of them, with India coming in second. Just like the frigates, it's a bit of a surprise that the U.S. Navy doesn't use Corvettes either. It seems like the Corvette class is more in line with what the U.S. Coast Guard handles rather than what the Navy deals with. Instead, the U.S. Navy has its own pair of relatively small surface vessels that are designed for operations close to shore. They're called Littoral Combat Ships, or LCS. These ships are meant to be agile, stealthy, and capable of taking on anti-access and asymmetric threats. They come equipped with a flight deck and hangar that can hold two SH-60 or MH-60 Seahawk helicopters. They've even got a ramp at the back for launching small boats, plus enough space and carrying capacity to transport a small assault force with their fighting vehicles. And if that's not enough, they're armed with some serious gear, like MK-110 57mm guns and RIM-116 rolling airframe missiles. These ships are also kitted out with their own air, surface, and underwater drones, and can handle aircraft operations in rough sea conditions, even up to Sea State 5. The first LCS, the USS Freedom, set sail in 2008. Despite being smaller than the frigates they're replacing, these ships maintain a similar level of firepower while requiring less than half the crew. With a top speed exceeding 40 knots, they're built for speed and maneuverability, perfect for literal operations. 
One of the most intriguing aspects of the LCS was its modular design, allowing for quick reconfiguration for different roles like anti-submarine or surface warfare. However, in practice, these changes took longer than expected and were logistically challenging. As a result, the US Navy shifted away from the modular concept and now operates them with a single module, streamlining their operations. Submarines When we delve into the world of warships, there's one game changer that completely flipped the script on naval warfare, the emergence of stealth submarines on the ocean's front line. Before that, it was all about surface-to-surface -surface battles, but the introduction of submarines took this maritime tussle to a whole new depth. Sure, torpedoes were doing their thing around the same time, but submarines were the only human-controlled machines that could plunge deep underwater to execute combat operations. Back in the American Revolution days, the submarine made its debut as a weapon in naval warfare. It all started with the Turtle, a one-person contraption crafted by a Yale student named David Bushnell. This thing, shaped like a walnut standing upright, was made of wood and powered by propellers cranked by the person inside. The plan was wild. Sneak up underwater to a British warship, stick a gunpowder charge to its hull using a screw device from inside the Turtle, and then skedaddle before it went boom. But when they tried it for real, the turtle couldn't drill through the copper on the ship's hull, so the whole thing fizzled out. But that little mishap sparked a whole series of improvements over the next 200 years, leading to the submarines we know today. When it comes to how they move, submarines fall into three main types, diesel electric, nuclear, and air independent propulsion. These days, North Korea is proud to have the biggest fleet of submarines, while in the US Navy, all the subs are nuclear powered. But it's not just the US, other countries also have their own nuclear powered underwater fleets. The real strength of a submarine lies in its ability to hide deep under the sea. Back in the day, submarines were easy to spot because of the noise they made. Water is way better at carrying sound than air, so submarines could pick up the racket of surface ships from miles away. But modern subs are all about stealth. They've got fancy propellers, soundproofing, and special gear to keep them quiet, almost blending in with the natural sounds of the ocean. It takes some serious tech to spot and take down these modern underwater beasts. In the US Navy, there are three main types of submarines, attack, cruise missile, and ballistic missile. Attack subs are like the all-rounders, using torpedoes and taking on different roles. They're smaller and faster, making them more agile. Cruise missile subs are the big guys, focusing on long-range strikes with guided missiles. And then there are the ballistic missile subs, which are all about carrying and launching nuclear missiles. But that's not the end of it. There's much more to talk about these impressive war machines, which serve to ramp up the tension in the arms race on one side, but also play a crucial role in balancing global power dynamics on the other. What do you think? Have these naval giants added in the positives of our lives? We're eager to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If this video has reeled you in, show some love for the United States Diligent crew by giving us a thumbs up. Share your insightful thoughts in the comments, and if you haven't already, consider subscribing to our channel for more captivating videos like this.